Thank you, Harry, for that, that uh, warm introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be back at Carleton. And I, I'd like to thank the History Department for inviting me to give uh, the Leffler Lecture, and also Nikki Lamberty for uh, her support in organizing my visit, and also for the poster that she designed, which I think captures the, the global spirit of the civil rights movement. Now, we are in the season of uh, anniversaries, uh, 50th anniversaries of the civil rights movement, as I think many of you know. And of course, in uh, you know, 2013, we had the uh, anniversary of the March on Washington, and uh, 2014, the anniversary, 50th anniversary of the, the uh, Civil Rights Act. And uh, we just marked a very sad anniversary of the Civil Rights era. Uh, February 21st was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X. So it's only fitting that uh, I will talk a little bit about Malcolm X and his significance and his legacy uh, in the course <coughs> of this presentation, uh, which is entitled, New York is like Johannesburg, Global Dimensions of the Post-War African-American Freedom Movement. And, uh, okay, I, I was hoping to uh, project the epigraphs that I have on, on my text here to spare me the, the, the difficulty and spare you the difficulty of listening and uh, you know, trying to sort of follow me as I talk about these, these epigraphs. I'd rather not read them, so, so the idea was to project them. And, uh, so please bear with us as we get that sorted out. I also would like to uh, show a film clip, some documentary footage from uh, 1961 that I was trying to show to uh, Professor Williams' class, but technology uh, did not permit on that occasion. But it looks like we're going to be able to do that today. So for all of you students who, uh, who felt deprived, uh, we, we are able uh, now to, to do that. So thank you. I think there's, I'll, I'll just have to read you. Read them. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read them. Uh, okay, and this is from Thurgood Marshall from 1939. At the present time, all eyes are focused on democracy in the United States, and it seems the fate of democracy depends on the United States. The true test, the true test of democracy is the equality of rights and privileges granted all citizens, which is measured by the protection of given minority groups. So that's Thurgood Marshall. Uh, and then this is a quote from Dr. King, Martin Luther King from 1957. Gosh, I just want to cover this up. <laughs> Ghana reminds us that freedom never comes on a silver platter. It's never easy. Ghana reminds us that whenever you break out of Egypt, you better get ready for stiff backs. You better get ready for some homes to be bombed. You better get ready for some churches to be bombed. You better get ready to go to prison. When I looked out and saw Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah there with his prison cap on that night, that reminded me that freedom never comes easy. That's Dr. King from 1957. And then finally, Gil Scott Heron from 1975. I know that they're struggling over there. It ain't gonna free me. Yeah, but we've all got to be struggling if we want to be free. New York is like Johannesburg. Freedom ain't nothing but a word. The epigraphs that begin this essay evoke a series of moments that amount to a sobering account of the unfinished struggle for US civil rights. These statements also remind us that over the course of the post-World War II civil rights movement, African Americans have often framed their demands for equality within international affairs and in relation to global freedom struggles. For their part, historians have acknowledged the Cold War context of the civil rights movement's major uh, legal and legislative reforms. But as Thurgood Marshall's statement suggests, granting pride of place to the Cold War as the international context for the movement limits our understanding of the movement and its origins. Marshall's statement reminds us that the rise of fascist dictatorships in Europe 
led civil rights activists to deploy anti-fascist arguments for civil rights. During World War II, African American movement leaders and foot soldiers alike echoed Marshall's warning that the fate of democracy was in the balance, and the nation's rhetoric of democratic freedom rang hollow in the face of U.S.-supported racial segregation in the military and throughout public life and, uh, and within uh, the, the, uh, the southern government uh, that uh, was, was full of white supremacist officials, uh, not only in the southern states, but the federal government. The United States was still failing to live up to its democratic ideals when Martin Luther King attended the independence festivities in the new uh, nation of Ghana in 1957. Fresh from the victorious Montgomery bus boycott, King wept as he witnessed the nation's prime minister, Kwame Nkrumah, address thousands while adorned in the cap he had worn during his imprisonment by British authorities. King described the euphoric occasion to his congregation in Montgomery, even as he reminded them of difficult days of suffering and sacrifice ahead. Roughly a decade after the achievement of formal equality through civil rights legislation, the musician and spoken word artist Gil Scott Heron addressed the persistence of U.S. racism by invoking the struggle against the apartheid regime in South Africa. If for King, Ghana's independence offered a beacon of hope for African-American freedom struggles, Scott Heron asserted a dismal equivalence between apartheid's past laws and police harassment of blacks in northern U.S. northern cities. Detroit is like Johannesburg. Let me see your ID to prove you are you instead of me. What might it mean to write a global history of the U.S. civil rights movement? After all, within the abundant literature on U.S. civil rights struggles and international relations, framings of global power differ considerably, with varying degrees of emphasis on the Cold War, U.S. policymakers, African-American civil rights liberals, the U.S. black left, and the decolonization of Africa. My account of the post-World War II African-American freedom movement tracks not only the history of the Cold War, but also parallel processes such as the decolonization of Africa and the non-aligned movement led by emerging African and Asian states who refused to take sides in the Cold War, uh, charting their own independent course for their economic development. As illustrated by the statements of Marshall, King, and Scott Heron, as African Americans marched and agitated for full citizenship, they often looked to a changing world situation to lend inspiration uh, or meaning to their efforts. Political change in Africa and in the United States resulted in a contradictory stance by the U.S. government. During the Cold War, U.S. policymakers promoted liberal democracy overseas and voiced support for desegregation and decolonization. By the mid-1960s, long overdue civil rights reforms dismantled state-supported racial segregation in the U.S. South. At the same time, U.S. foreign policy increasingly supported racist white minority regimes in Southern Africa and used military force in opposing nationalist struggles in the Congo and in Vietnam. Throughout the post-war period, Cold War repression and anti-black elements in federal and state governments showed no tolerance for an independent critique of U.S. foreign policy by African Americans. To speak of the U.S. civil rights movement in a global context is to render a more expansive conception of the movement, one that is not confined to liberal civil rights leaders and organizations. To a great extent, a global emphasis on the movement foregrounds African American radical critics of U.S. Cold War foreign policy, a key constituency often excluded from accounts of the movement until recently. <coughs> U.S. foreign policy makers maintained a keen interest in the international travels of African-American radicals, as well as black liberal intellectuals, journalists, performing artists, and activists during the civil rights era. Some traveled abroad under the aegis of U.S. cultural diplomacy projects. Others, to the chagrin of U.S. officials, participated in independent world congresses sponsored by the international left, or anti-colonial non-aligned gatherings. Their actions were part of a time-honored strategy by African Americans since the abolition movement of the 19th century to appeal to the court of war world opinion in protesting U.S. racial injustice. At the height of the Cold War, 
The U.S. government restricted the mobility of such dissidents as W.E.B. Du Bois, who was denied a visa to attend the 1956 First World Congress of Negro Artists and Writers in Paris. Du Bois cabled a scathing protest to the gathering, claiming that the black American delegation was a mouthpiece for U.S. Cold War propaganda. Whether or not the U.S. sponsored their overseas travels, African Americans carried the struggle for civil rights in the U.S. to foreign audiences. The civil rights movement that challenged American apartheid in the South was far from monolithic in tactics and philosophy. There was a world of difference between the charismatic leadership style and methods of Dr. King and his Southern Christian Leadership Con Conference, and the democratic group leadership exercised by the young activists in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, all of whom embraced Ella Baker's strategy of empowering the most marginalized black people. Within movement circles, internationalism itself was contested, and its terms and meanings changed over time. During the 1950s, black liberals and radicals alike, from Martin Luther King to the Little Rock Nine, to the North Carolina NAACP official and armed self-defense advocate Robert Williams, invoked Cold War anti-internationalism uh, as a language of protest. From their perspective, the Cold War civil rights argument was a frontal attack on the white South's massive resistance to desegregation. Civil rights activists uh, claim, their, their, their claims that Jim Crow segregation undermined U.S. national security were intended to shame white supremacist extremists before the eyes of the world for their demagoguery, their mob violence, and unabashed bigotry. The problem was that white supremacists in government and at all levels of Southern society had no shame and used Cold War anti-communism to red bait the civil rights movement. King seemed particularly drawn to Cold War arguments in support of civil rights, in part as a defense against the incessant red baiting of the movement and himself by segregationists. But strategically invoking the Cold War to advocate for desegregation and civil rights was ultimately of limited value to movement activists. Such rhetoric failed to deliver positive results. It failed to secure federal intervention, to convert racist opposition, win over apathetic whites, or most, of, uh, most important of all, inspire the movement's foot soldiers to take action. The Cold War had far less influence over the mood and actions of young protesters than did the catalytic effect of the Montgomery bus boycott and other nonviolent direct, direct action protests against segregation throughout the South. Such was the moral force and urgency of nonviolent sit-in demonstrations and their eloquent leaders uh, that the freedom movement and its vision of beloved community reverberated throughout American culture and society, politicizing the efforts of musicians, artists, and athletes. The champion sprinter Wilma Rudolph, winner of three gold medals in the 1960 uh, Rome Olympics, insisted that her homecoming celebration in Clarksville, Tennessee was the town's first ever integrated municipal event. Events in Africa occasionally render the Cold War context superfluous in the minds of African American activists. When police in South Africa fired on nonviolent protesters in March 1960, killing 69 and wounding scores in the infamous Sharpeville massacre, the student sit-in movement was spreading like wildfire throughout the South. The Dean of Civil Rights Leadership, the labor leader A. Philip Randolph, paid tribute to the fallen South African protesters, invoking a black diaspora consciousness that predated the Cold War. To Randolph, these, and I'm quoting him, quote, black gods and comely goddesses that lie slain on their own lands have not only given up their lives for their own liberty, but also for the Negroes of African descent on the North and South American continents, end of quote. The global black consciousness voiced by Randolph, derived from Garveyite and anti-colonial ideals, was more common among African American civil rights leaders uh, as, as, than, than I think uh, a lot of uh, earlier scholarship on the civil rights movement acknowledged. Events like the Sharpeville massacre led many activists to draw parallels between the violence of the apartheid state and uh, the violence of Southern Jim Crow particularly in the Mississippi Delta. More generally, within movement and activist circles, internationalism, 
uh, or global consciousness, as I was, as I was saying, is contested. African American activists were not on the same page with respect to global affairs. Black activists sometimes invoked opposing forms of internationalism. Some voiced demands for equality within the framework of Cold War liberalism. Others emphasized support of African and Third World liberation movements. For many, the steep challenges faced by movements to dismantle segregation laws uh, throughout the South and achieve voting rights against the resistance of local authorities rendered international considerations irrelevant. But Cold War politics imposed a protocol on civil rights activists and organizations to refrain from criticism of U.S. foreign policy. SNCC, the most radical of the major civil rights organizations, had defied that protocol by opposing the Vietnam War in January of 1966. But when Dr. King declared his opposition to the war in Vietnam in April of 1967, he faced withering criticism from not only the political establishment, but also from other civil rights leaders who believed that King's criticism of Lyndon Johnson's war had betrayed the cause of civil rights at home. The realm of culture provides additional evidence for the movement's uh, international significance and reach. The historian Kendall Jackson has used the term black cultural traffic to describe the international circulation through mass media and print journalism of ideas, images, music, and expressive cultures of African descended peoples. The era of the long civil rights movement from roughly the late 1930s to 1968 is arguably the period uh, is arguably the period in which this black cultural traffic was at its peak. Propelled by the convergence of the US black movement, decolonization struggles in Africa and the Caribbean, and the global circulation of American and African American culture through mass communications media. Black cultural traffic carried with it the circulation of images of African Americans' struggles, struggle for equality, as well as political ideas and exchanges of racialized experience and knowledge <coughs> between African Americans, Africans, and West Indians, Afro-West Indians. The internationally renowned concert singer and stage and film actor Paul Robeson, arguably the most politically active exponent of black cultural traffic, had worked with the Trinidadian activist C.L.R. James during Robeson's extended stay in London during the 1930s. Robeson also forged close ties to African nationalists in London and studied African languages at the School of Oriental and Asian Studies. At the pinnacle of his fame during World War II, Robeson, as co-chair of the Council on African Affairs, an African-American lobby, criticized U.S. Cold War foreign policy, European colonialism, and lynching and Jim Crow discrimination against African Americans. As Cold War investigations targeted dissidents, Robeson suffered political repression as an outspoken citizen artist, foreshadowing the U.S. government's opposition to independent African-American declarations of solidarity with African liberation struggles. Robeson regained his passport, ending his internal exile, and resumed his concert tours. Though silenced by illness, Robeson inspired a younger generation of politically engaged black entertainers, including Harry Belafonte and the less celebrated but fascinating novelist, actor, and journalist, Julian Mayfield. Our understanding of the global resonances of black and African freedom struggles has been enriched by biographical studies of Robeson, Mayfield, and other African Americans whose activism bridged black, US black, left wing, and pan-African struggles. Historical accounts of the transnational lives and activities of such African American civil rights and labor activists as Robert Williams, Bayard Rustin, Maida Springer, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Thurgood Marshall, and Malcolm X force us to reject the notion that support for full and equal citizenship and solidarity with African liberation were diametric ideological positions. The career of Bayard Rustin provides an illustration of how demands for civil rights were part and parcel of a global vision of political change. Rustin, the brilliant strategist and advisor of Martin Luther King, brought his grasp of world affairs, acquired through his study of Gandhian nonviolence in India and ties to Gold Coast nationalism, to bear on the Southern Christian Leadership Conference's statement to the South and the nation. Rustin called upon African Americans in the South and across the nation to engage in nonviolent resistance against injustice, noting that the determination of Negro Americans to become first-class citizens 
was bound together with, quote, Asia's successive revolts against European imperialism, Africa's present ferment for independence, and Hungary's death struggle against communism, end of quote. In the following account of the global engagements of African-American activists, ranging from civil rights liberals to black world militants and radicals, the concepts of black cultural traffic, transnational biographies, and the international circulation of African-American expressive cultures all suggest the ways in which civil rights activism was imbued with a powerful global presence and significance. A key portion of my account of intersections between US black struggles and the decolonization of Africa since World War II examines Ghana's pan-African political project under the leadership of that West African nation's prime minister and first president, Kwame Nkrumah. First, I argue for the importance of World War II as a catalyst for the modern civil rights movement. The war was of much greater significance than the often asserted and, to my mind, untested view that the Cold War provided leverage for civil rights activists and civil rights reforms. World War II energized African Americans' multi-front assault on the edifice of Southern Jim Crow. African American newspapers promoted the Double V campaign, which linked black people's, black Americans' support for victory uh, against fascism overseas with their demand for victory at home against the South's racial tyranny of Jim Crow. African American and African activists and journalists interpreted the Atlantic Charter's rhetoric of democracy and self-determination for their own ends. On the eve of hostilities, the African American sportsmen, Olympians, uh, Olympian Jesse Owens and heavyweight boxer Joe Lewis, had gained well-publicized symbolic victories against stand-ins for Hitler's brand of Aryan supremacy. Journalist Roy Otley's New World of Coming, uh, a book published in 1943, chronicled African Americans' hopes for the demise of state-supported racism at home and colonialism abroad. U.S. and military officials' wartime appeals for national unity and against racial and religious bigotry made the South's de jure segregation and racism seem immoral and outmoded to many Americans. Black war veterans who had endured the indignities of service in a segregated U.S. Army returned to southern towns and cities. They were the shock troops of post-war interracial campaigns for voting rights. Medgar Evers, an African-American war veteran who had served in Europe, was typical of many black servicemen who refused to submit to second-class citizenship after fighting overseas to save democracy. Returning to his native Mississippi, he and four other black veterans registered to vote in Decatur, Mississippi, <coughs> only to be barred from voting by armed whites waiting for them at the polls. Later, Evers led the NAACP office in Jackson and became one of the movement's many martyrs gunned down by an unapologetic white supremacist in 1963. The war shaped the political outlook of black civilians as well. African American workers in defense industries based in Detroit could thank not only the alliance between the United the Automobile Workers Labor Union and the NAACP for their manufacturing jobs. Painfully aware of their second class status, they might have also ironically attributed their good fortune to Hitler and Tojo for declaring war on the United States. The broad-based civil rights activism of the wartime years set the stage for the de decisive civil rights struggles of the 1950s and 1960s. The brilliant organizing of NAACP Field Secretary Ella Baker <coughs> and the association's high-profile advocacy on behalf of victims of racial injustice in the US and abroad all helped dramatically increase, to increase the organization's membership to 460,000, much of it in the South. Baker's efforts had turned the NAACP into a mass organization, which is uh, quite, a, quite a feat. This vast growth, particularly in the South, enabled the, the organization to mount legal challenges to discrimination in bus transportation and public higher education, as well as demand redress against the mistreatment of African-American soldiers and civilians before and after the war. Indeed, wartime civil rights militancy, rather than the Cold War, informed Robert Carter's NAACP amicus brief in support of Mexican-American plaintiffs in Mendez v. Westminster, uh, a case of 1946, in which a federal appellate court declared public school segregation unconstitutional. 
The NAACP appellate brief in Mendez put forth the argument that later proved successful in the Brown decision, which occurred during an intense Cold War atmosphere. And the language in Brown cited international criticism of U.S. racial discrimination, as well as social science and scholarship attesting to the psychic harm inflicted on African American children by segregation. The pervasive nature of U.S. information and propaganda during World War II had awakened expectations among the American public that ordinary citizens could play a role in shaping U.S. foreign policy and the post-war order through such international bodies as the United Nations. African Americans deemed the United Nations an appropriate venue for criticizing U.S. racial segregation and demanding civil rights. Outraged by the post-war wave of lethal anti-black violence in the South directed at black men and women, civil rights coalitions pressed the new president, Harry S. Truman, a Democrat from the Jim Crow state of Missouri, to support federal intervention. And Truman stopped short of endorsing intervention to protect black victims of white violence. But even as he gave what was an unprecedented endorsement of civil rights, Truman's antagonistic foreign policy toward the wartime ally of the United States, the Soviet Union, faithfully shifted the ground under African American activists. For U.S. officialdom, the Cold War struggle with the Soviet Union discredited the wartime democratic vision of African American activists who linked movements for desegregation and voting rights at home with anti-colonial struggles abroad. Cold War anti-communist purges and federal loyalty investigations also extinguished the wartime alliance between the labor movement and civil rights organizations. Before the Cold War came to dominate U.S. domestic politics, a vibrant African American politics linking civil rights and anti-colonialism attracted a wide-ranging black popular front of middle class and left-wing activists and organizations. And all of this happened under the leadership of Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois. And they were involved, of course, in the Council on African Affairs, which was a lobby that tried to educate the public on issues of African affairs and took a strong anti-colonial line and very critical, of course, of U.S. Cold War foreign policy. And for that criticism, of course, critics like Du Bois and Robeson paid a severe price. The silencing of Robeson, Du Bois, and others in the Council on African Affairs by government repression provided a harsh lesson not only for black anti-colonial leftists but also for civil rights liberals. Cold War strictures also exacted a toll on those who dared to condemn U.S. racial violence before foreign audiences. Such was the case when African American dancer and choreographer Catherine Dunham debuted her anti-lynching dance Southland in Santiago, Chile in 1951. Thereafter, Dunham and her company found themselves under federal surveillance. For civil rights leaders in the U.S., it was less a capitulation than a bid for the survival of their organizations when African American liberals and pragmatic anti-communist leftists developed the Cold War civil rights argument, reframing civil rights reforms as a strategic national necessity for prevailing in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Portrayal of desegregation as an instrument of Cold War foreign policy informed the Brown decision and, of course, shaped much civil rights activism after the fact. But the NAACP's legal victory, the product of years of painstaking work, proved a hollow one as white Southerners refused to comply with court-ordered desegregation. It was left to African Americans in the South and their allies and supporters in the North, drawing on wartime legacies of struggle, to stage nonviolent mass demonstrations seeking the desegregation of public accommodations throughout the South. So this next section is entitled The International Origins of Nonviolent Direct Action. And it really sort of talks about the roots of the Gandhian roots of the modern civil rights movement. And I'll just skip ahead to talk about the Montgomery bus boycott, which led to the demise of city and state segregation laws in public transportation 
Uh, and the, the story of the bus boycott is well known. Local black activists, uh, there was mounting outrage against segregation on Montgomery's buses, and uh, Rosa Parks' refusal to yield her seat led to the formation of the Montgomery Improvement Association, which led to them drafting a uh, 26-year-old Baptist minister, Martin Luther King, to lead the movement, um, and which also led uh, to the involvement of the veteran corps activist and pacifist Bayard Rustin joining King as an advisor. And um, it's, it's interesting to think about the sequence of events. All of these events, so the Brown decision, the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, the South African defiance campaign, the nonviolent protest, the independence of Ghana, are all happening and unfolding simultaneously. So you can sort of, if you try to capture the political imagination of all of the main figures in the civil rights movement, it's clear that um, they're, they have all these developments and connections between them in mind. Uh, and Kwame Nkrumah, as the Prime Minister of Independent Ghana, made a point of forging direct connections with the U.S. Uh, uh, civil rights movement. Nkrumah invited Martin Luther King, Ralph Bunch, A. Philip Randolph, and other African American and West Indian dignitaries to celebrate Ghana's independence in 1957 as a gesture of solidarity with the, the cause of U.S. civil rights. And um, so what you have with uh, the Montgomery boycott and the achievement of independence in Ghana was this tremendous idealism and hope around non, the use of nonviolent methods <coughs> to achieve social change. And that optimism for peaceful political change in both the United States and Africa uh, came up short against the, um, the violent repression of nonviolent protesters in South Africa and the Congo crisis in 1960. 1960 was considered the year of Africa when many African nations were going to achieve uh, independence from European colonial rule. And so throughout the Western press, uh, there's a lot of hope attached to this. But uh, in March of 1960, police in Sharpeville fired upon nonviolent demonstrators. And then in June, uh, the Congo, a vast nation in Central Africa, was fractured by civil war immediately after independence, uh, after nearly a, central, a century of colonial rule in Belgium. In February 1961, Belgian officials announced the death of the Congo's democratically elected Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba. Uh, and of course, they did not mention at the time <clears throat> that Lumumba was executed by Belgian military forces. Like Nkrumah, Lumumba was popular among African Americans who had an avid interest in African affairs. And a small but vocal contingent of African American activists, including the writer Maya Angelou, angrily disrupted a, a session on the Congo at the United Nations, uh, holding the, the UN, Belgium, and the US accountable for Lumumba's death. The riot, as it was billed in the New York Times the next morning, the riot at the United Nations uh, made front page news all over the country the following day prompting allegations in the press of communist influence on the demonstrators. So this is when I'm going to show the clip. Uh, this is a, a newsreel from Cafe News, a British uh, film company. Um, it really gives you a sense of the Cold War lens through which contemporary uh, observers uh, view not only the civil rights movement, but African uh, liberation movements. So, um, so what we have is this very incredible document, which is kind of a uh, justification for Lumumba's removal, but it also has footage of this African-American demonstration at the UN that I alluded to, and it's very uh, unusual footage. And if you look really closely, I think you can see and hear Maya Angelou uh, in uh, taking part in this demonstration. So without further ado, it's, it's a little lengthy, and this may uh, do some extend the slaying of Patrice Lumumba, the post Congo premier, touches off worldwide demonstrations, small groups of students and others, as here in Chicago and in London. Pendulous bonds, it is believed, of communists and their dudes in deliberate organized attempts to undermine democracy and the United Nations. They hardly speak with a rank and fight. 
In Moscow, where such scenes are rare unless propaganda is served, demonstrators converge on the Belgian embassy, attacking the Belgians in dark Hammarskjöld, even as Russia withdraws recognition of the Secretary General. Here is the symbol of the turmoil in the Congo, the late Patrice Lumumba, the left-leaning nationalist agitator, head of the Congolese national movement which catapulted him to the premiership. But in two months he was out, deposed by arch-political rival President Joseph Kasabubu, who accused him of pro-communism and of creating chaos. Earlier, Lumumba visited the UN with his pro-red Vice Premier Antoine Gizenga, who later set up a separatist regime which the Kremlin supports, leading President Moise Shomba of the secessionist province of Katanga to state that it threatens a Korean situation in the Congo. And it was in Katanga that Lumumba met his death. He shown in last pictures when he was flown in for detention, later to be slain by tribesmen, touching off the new crisis. At the United Nations in New York, demonstrators reflect the chain reaction of tension as the Security Council prepares to debate the Congo crisis. The boycott of Dark Hammarskjöld by the Soviet Union and its demand for withdrawal of UN troops from the Congo are pressing matters of the moment. Mr. Hammarskjöld is to stand firm, informing Russia he will not be driven out of his post, that he means to stay as long as he's needed. Then the council hears American Ambassador Anthony Stevenson defend the Secretary General and the UN Congo peace effort. We believe that the only way to keep the Cold War out of the Congo is to keep the United Nations in the Congo. And we call on the Soviet Union to join us in thus ensuring the free and untrammeled exercise by the Congolese people of their right to independence and to democracy. Soon afterwards comes the violently unexpected. A demonstration breaks out in the spectators' gallery, interrupting Mr. Stevenson. Officials call it the worst outbreak to occur at the UN, touched off as if on cue by rioters who are joined by others who burst through the doors from the corridor outside. The news of the day camera records the tumult that ensues. Uh, Africa had a, a, a presence and a visibility in, in the Western press 
that is, is kind of hard to imagine now. Uh, but uh, this whole, con what, what we call the Congo crisis, unfolded over many months during which Lumumba was missing, his whereabouts unknown, and then the announcement uh, of his death in, in February of 1961 uh, really resonated with African-American activists uh, who, who saw the whole thing, um, you know, the, 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 the political killing of an African leader happening in, in real time. I mean, this is, and you, you noted the, the demonstrations uh, throughout many world capitals. Uh, in that atmosphere of Cold War hegemony at that time, uh, people basically assumed that these demonstrations were all sort of communist-inspired and thus not to be taken seriously politically. Um, so I have uh, a few more sections dealing with the African-American expatriates in Ghana and also Malcolm X. Uh, bear in mind that Malcolm X uh, left what was, was uh, ousted from the Nation of Islam in 1963 after commenting on uh, the assassination of JFK which he was instructed not to do, and he linked JFK's death to the United States sponsorship of and use of violence to achieve its foreign policy goals uh, around the world. He mentioned uh, the CIA coup in South Vietnam that got rid of our allies, our then allies, uh, the DM brothers in South Vietnam, and he also mentioned the Congo crisis and the ouster of Patrice Lumumba. Uh, and, you know, that was, Lumumba's death was, uh, was at the hands of the Belgians, but uh, U.S. intelligence was, was certainly involved as well. And Malcolm kept returning to the Congo situation in uh, many of his speeches uh, after that. And, and Malcolm really embodied the political vision of these African-American radicals who were expatriates in Ghana, who saw themselves as supporting Nkrumah's political goals of African continental uh, unity and uh, you know, uh, continuing to fight for the independence of those uh, African territories still under foreign rule. Uh, and, and Nkrumah and his uh, assistant, his advisor, George Padmore, who's from Trinidad, really uh, tried to recruit African Americans to uh, come, African Americans in West Indies, and, and, and really radicals from all over the world, not, not just black people, to come to, to Ghana to help build the new nation. And so they invited uh, African American journalists, professionals, labor, civil rights activists, um, to play prominent roles in, in building the new nation. And Nkrumah invited W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, the uh, black scholar, and his wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois, uh, both activists to Ghana in 1961. And uh, Ghana increasingly became a haven for African Americans who were exiles, who were fleeing political repression. <laughs> Not just Cold War repression, but uh, sort of political and Jim Crow repression in the United States. I'll give one example. Preston King uh, was the son of a prominent African-American family in Albany, Georgia. And King was studying political science at the London School of Economics. And when his draft board back in Albany discovered that he was a black man, they started addressing him in the very demeaning first name address. You know, instead of Mr. King, it was Dear Preston. Uh, which was, you know, the, the, the way the whole Jim Crow system functioned to sort of uh, reduce and, and dehumanize African Americans, to, to really infantilize them in a way. And, and so King refused to cooperate with his draft board until they addressed him uh, as respectfully as others would be addressed. And he was uh, brought back to Albany. He was found guilty of defying his draft board. And he went back to London, resumed his studies, and then found out that he had an invalid US passport. He, the United States had revoked his passport. And uh, Britain would not issue him a passport. And so Ghana gave him political asylum. And so for 30 years, he was a, a fugitive from America. He, if he had returned to the United States, he would have been jailed. Uh, and on, on these really sort of minor and, and sort of trivial uh, charges in a way. 
And so uh, he received asylum in Ghana, and uh, he, as I said, could not return from the United, to the United States for 30 years until he was pardoned in, two, in the year 2000 by President Bill Clinton. Uh, and so um, there was a, a shift in the early 50s before independence where many African Americans volunteered. They were volunteer expatriates. You know, they were idealists and they wanted to help build a new nation. Um, in, in large part because Nkrumah and then Dr. King, you know, sort of spread the word that uh, folks with skills to contribute were welcome to go to Ghana. But after 1961 and the Congo crisis and the, the, the sort of the, um, the violent backlash against uh, African nationalism represented the Congo crisis, the expatriates tended to be more political refugees from Jim Crow in the United States, uh, uh, like Preston King and others. So the, 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 the African-American ex expatriates in Ghana had a very radical critique of Cold War liberalism, of gradualism in the civil rights movement, uh, and they also were critical of a U.S. foreign policy that was becoming closer and closer and more sympathetic to uh, white minority regimes in Southern Africa. And they tried constantly, because they're in Ghana, and you know, they're constantly trying to figure out how can we express our solidarity with the cause of civil rights in the United States? How can we connect with those struggles? And so during the march on Washington, they staged a protest at the U.S. Embassy uh, at which they criticized JFK's uh, foreign policy attempts to you know, sort of overthrow the Castro regime in Cuba. Uh, again, the closeness, the increasing closeness mm -hmm. with uh, racist uh, regimes in, in South Africa. And there were actually many counterpart demonstrations to the March on Washington in uh, 1963. Uh, if you go to the State Department uh, records, you will see uh, reports on demonstrations in Paris, in Tel Aviv, uh, in Cairo, uh, in Berlin, uh, London. Uh, but the one that is the thickest file uh, is, is the, uh, the demonstration that the African American patriots, uh, including Maya Angelou, who uh, shown in that in that video, uh, took part in in, in Ghana. So. Um, the African American expatriates had this vision. You know, they were certainly, they, they saw Nkrumah as an ally for African American struggles, uh, for equality. And of course, they supported uh, Nkrumah's agenda of, of African liberation. Uh, but the person, the most powerful exponent of their point of view was Malcolm X. And uh, Malcolm uh, was uh, someone who was constantly critical of, of uh, U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and the leading Ghana uh, expatriate member of the African American expatriate community in Ghana, Julian Mayfield, invited Malcolm X to come to Ghana in 1964. And during, throughout Malcolm's visit, um, the black expatriate community hoped to establish uh, operational linkages with civil rights organizations, particularly the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And Malcolm traveled throughout West Africa and the Middle East, aided by uh, contacts with African diplomats that he had made while he was based in Harlem uh, with the Nation of Islam. And Malcolm's political thought really centered on global politics, particularly the continuing unrest in, in the Congo. Uh, and at the Oxford Debate Union in December 1964, Malcolm condemned uh, Belgium's military offensive waged with US air support against Congolese nationalists and um, that intervention was portrayed in the press as a humanitarian rescue of European hostages taken by Congolese rebels. But uh, in fact, the intervention uh, and the bombing uh, uh, led to the, the, the slaughter of some 3,000 Congolese civilians. So Malcolm condemned the apparent indifference in the Western press to uh, the loss of life uh, on such a grand scale among Africans. Uh, as well as uh, Mississippi's failure to prosecute known perpetrators of uh, murderous violence against civil rights demonstrators. To Malcolm, the issue was not his advocacy of uh, African Americans' right to armed self-defense, but it was the issue was the United States and pro-segregation forces' uh, use of violence with total impunity. So 
Um, Malcolm is making these, uh, these harsh criticisms of U.S. power as he's traveling in, in the last year of his life through Europe, Africa, the Middle East, of course, where he has the, uh, the, the pilgrimage, uh, the spiritual awakening uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in connecting with, with global Islam. And ultimately in Ghana, I mean, you know, we, we know how, how Malcolm's, Malcolm's uh, story ended, but um, in Ghana, the African American expatriates ultimately had to confront the limitations of their efforts to try to forge operational links with uh, U.S. civil rights uh, and um, um, black radical struggles. Um, they had this vision of Afro-diasporic citizenship where, uh, in which uh, they were advocating for African liberation with equal fervor as the full uh, citizenship and equality of, of African Americans. Um, and their vision really sort of fitted out, particularly when Nkrumah was overthrown by a coup in 1966. But this vision of Afro-diasporic citizenship uh, uh, returned to the fore in the 1980s uh, in the United States and the International Free South Africa Movement and an organization called TransAfrica, uh, which was uh, an African-American foreign policy lobby. And these organizations orchestrated a series of anti-apartheid demonstrations at the South African Embassy in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and members of the Congressional Black Caucus were involved in that as well. And the protests galvanized anti-apartheid activism in the United States, joining Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu's criticism of the Reagan administration's policy of constructive engagement, uh, and high-level black appointees to the Reagan administration, including Clarence Thomas and Clarence Pendleton, opposed the demonstrations against uh, apartheid. Pendleton dismissed the protest as motivated by what he called a mere, and I quote, pigment attachment. <laughs> the black conservative wondered whether a black person at the top of the military would defend U.S. interests in South Africa. And this is a quote from Pendleton. Are they going to be just blacks or go beyond that? End of quote. So here we are in 2015, uh, thinking of the movement's legacy, and I found Richard Wright's novel, The Outsider, to be um, a, a, a very uh, sort of provocative way of, of thinking about uh, this legacy. And I think that his uh, novel, well, a, a portion of this novel that I'll, that I'll share with you, really uncannily speaks to the, the much of our present condition. Uh, and we're seeing today uh, and sort of an active campaign in U.S. public policy to roll back the signal of achievement of the civil rights movement uh, in, in, the way, in the form of voting rights. And in addition, we're seeing this proliferation, uh, you know, thanks to social media, uh, of problems of police misconduct and, and, and violence and racial disparities in crime punishment and incarceration. Uh, which seem to have gotten worse than the problems that Bill Scott Heron was, was talking about in 1975. In 1953, Wright cast a pox on both houses uh, of American capitalism and Soviet communism. Those systems, he, he asserted, contain the seeds of the destruction of Western progress and modernity. The few hundred years, and I'm quoting right here, of freedom, empire building, voting, liberty, democracy, uh, end of quote, would yield to what one of his fictional characters described as, and I quote, a more terrifyingly human future. Uh, and this is how uh, Wright framed the issue uh, through his character. There will be no trial by jury, no writs of habeas corpus, no freedom of speech, of religion. All of this is being buried and not by communists or fascists alone, but by their opponents as well. All hands are shoveling clay onto the body of freedom before it even dies, while it lies breathing, it la breathing its last." End of quote. So those secular and modern Cold War systems, belief systems, uh, American capitalism and democracy and, and Soviet totalitarianism and, and communism, would be, in the end, undermined by greed, corruption, and cynicism, and would subsequently be rejected by much of the world's population. 
but replaced by the rise of new forms of religious fundamentalism. And uh, you can look this up in uh, Wright's novel, 1953 novel, The Outsider. In this and other writings, Richard Wright seems to have sensed that civil rights, integration, and formal equality envisioned solely within the U.S. terrain would not be enough. Wright helps us to understand how devastating the movement's repeatedly deferred agenda of peace and economic justice was for the nation and the world. The liberatory impact of the civil rights movement was limited as well by the Cold War's containment by the U.S. and Western powers of the democratic aspirations and secular nationalisms of the formerly colonized world. In closing, we would do well to recall remarks Malcolm X made in Detroit roughly a week before his assassination. Having returned from the Middle East, Africa, and Europe, where French authorities denied him uh, uh, entry into their country, uh, and Malcolm was scheduled to, uh, to meet with French student leftists, but uh, of course the, the French uh, kept him out of the country, Malcolm advised his audience to think for themselves and study history and world affairs with a critical eye. He urged his listeners to educate themselves in politics and to question the mass media's complicity in spreading U.S. Pop propaganda <coughs> on African affairs and U.S. race relations. Malcolm even faulted himself for misleading his followers about the polarizing doctrines of the Nation of Islam. Malcolm's injunction for U.S. citizens to remain vigilant in resisting the manipulations of those with outsized and destructive wealth and power, and those who do their bidding in politics and the media, is, a, is an important part of his legacy that we should all know and that we should all cherish. Thank you. Uh, 
U.S. policymakers uh, in, in sort of making this, you know, this, this civil rights movement happen, uh, advancing the struggle. Um, so you have this emphasis on presidential administrations and civil rights, but then you had uh, another uh, tendency in the scholarship that wanted to sort of foreground African American agency and indigenous African American institutions uh, to make the argument that the civil rights movement is something that is uh, coming out of indigenous black institutions like the black church uh, and, and the black political infrastructure. Um, as Alden Morris argued in his uh, study of the origins of the civil rights movement. So the long civil rights movement um, also, for me, uh, brings back into the discussion the contributions of black radicals. Um, you had, I think, civil rights historiography dominated for many years by a sort of political respectability that under the Cold War felt that you could just dismiss black radicals and black leftists as marginal, as insignificant. But um, black leftists and black radicals were part of a sort of a broader based, uh, longer tradition of civil rights activism. And I, I, I think that as, you know, we're, we're not under the Cold, War, the Cold War hegemony anymore that you saw in the documentary. And so um, it, it, I think it's really important to talk about African American leftists, particularly African American leftists who were in the South, in the belly of the beast, and who were absolutely crucial for the, you know, sort of uh, creating the conditions for the civil rights activism of the 19th. 50s and 60s. Uh, Ella Baker had these uh, leadership workshops in the South and Southern cities in the 1940s, and Rosa Parks attended one of those workshops in 1946. So it's, the long civil rights movement is another way to sort of combat the, the myth of spontaneity that Rosa Parks refused to get up, get uh, to, to rise from her seat because she was tired, and what it does is it recovers uh, a longer tradition of black activism. Yes? Thank you so much for your talk. I wonder if you can speak a little bit more about how your study informs the relationship between nation, race, and terrorism. Mm -hmm. Because what, what struck me about the right commentary is that it links this, the Cold War to the present and to the ways in which people become racialized as terrorists whether it's kind of a socialist, whether it's like the red terror, or whether it's about Islamophobia. Um, and it has a lot to do with kind of the position of what, what the nation is, whether it's decolonization in Africa, or it's kind of moments when we talk about the Islamic State, or it's what is the future of Iraqi democracy. So I'm wondering if you can just um, tell us about how these are kind of informing these um, the, the, the modern era. Well, I mean, as as <coughs> as we all know, we're in the middle of tremendous of a tremendous culture war around issues of religion, uh, and there's a lot of distortion um, and misleading around uh, the the meaning of um, <coughs> several world religions, including Islam, but. Uh, at the same time, we do have this, you know, very real phenomenon of, of terrorism that needs to be combated in many ways. And, and one of the stories that I didn't tell, or that could be told within a global narrative of the civil rights movement, is, and, and especially in uh, conjunction with Malcolm X, is... Malcolm X's impact, and you know, Taylor Branch argues in one of his biographies of King, I think it's the second one, I could be mistaken, that Malcolm X's most significant and enduring contribution was promoting the expansion of Islam in the United States. And that is a really important story. And to tell the story of African Americans and Islam, I think would be an, an interesting counter to a lot of the, um, the, the sort of the moral panic and disinformation that, uh, that, that we're dealing with now 
on uh, issues of, of Islam. And not only disinformation and the, the sort of the, um, the, the, the perversion or the, or the, um, the, the distortion of, of the faith by um, conservatives in the United States, but obviously by you know, uh, these, uh, these terrorists in, in, in the Middle East. So I think it's, it's really important to, to think about African Americans' engagement with Islam. This is also the 50th anniversary of John Coltrane's classic album, A Love Supreme. And A Love Supreme is a statement of religious devotion by John Coltrane. It's, it's really a great piece of music. And it reflects um, his, his faith, which is, you know, um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't say that Coltrane converted to Islam, but um, Islam is a, is a big part of his spirituality. And I think that, that recovering that history of African Americans' engagement with Islam, bear in mind that Malcolm X was the spiritual teacher for Muhammad Ali, and Muhammad Ali became, you know, went on to become the most famous and well-known uh, instantly <coughs> American all over the world. And, you know, all, all of Muhammad Ali's statements about the racial situation, about politics, global politics, you know, at his peak, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was Malcolm's doing. That was Malcolm's teaching. So, you know, I, I, I didn't really talk about and could have talked about within a, a global account of the civil rights movement, uh, Malcolm's role in um, bringing Islam. I mean, it, it, it didn't obviously begin with Malcolm, but uh, I think Malcolm X's influence on African Americans both promoted the spread of Islam, but transcended religion in um, exposing uh, African Americans of all faiths to the, the kind of worldview and um, criticism of, of U.S. power, both at home and around the world, um, that uh, one could read in the pages of his newspaper, of the Nation of Islam newspaper, Muhammad Speaks. And, and the, the Muhammad Speaks, the Nation of Islam newspaper, was sort of a, had a sort of a split personality. There would be lengthy speeches from Elijah Muhammad that had the really recondite Nation of Islam spiritual doctrine. But there were other parts of the paper that were as good a, a selection of, and a digest of foreign affairs and world affairs and African affairs uh, than you could find any place else in the black press. And, and those sections were edited by Malcolm as well as um, secular editors who were, you know, who were fairly radical in, in their politics. So I don't know if that really gets at, at, at your question. I, I think that there is a story to be told, I did not tell it today, about African Americans and Islam that would sort of focus on uh, figures like uh, Muhammad Ali and uh, Malcolm X, all these jazz musicians, modern jazz, bebop musicians who converted to Islam in the 1950s, 1940s, and 1950s. Um, you know, I think that would be um, really enlightening for, uh, for our fellow citizens. Okay, uh, yes. Um, so in reading your uh, chapter on Malcolm X in Ghana, I was really interested sort of in the kind of tension you highlight between like blackness and Americanness, mm -hmm. and have sort of like this grasping for like a transnational Afro-diasporic modernity, is sort of a way to transcend this, uh, you know, sort of like divided identity. Um, and I, I was really struck by sort of the com like sort of the, the point you make about sort of how uh, like even the, like the very term Afro-American or African-American strikes us today as very inno innocuous, but when it first came about, it was a very radical sort of assertion of this identity. So I'm wondering, do you like do you see like the fact that it's now so innocuous and so accepted today um, as <clears throat> like a sign of success of the movement? Like the fact that we like you know almost take it for granted, or has this 
So or has the term been co-opted and sort of the modernity you know, deferred? <coughs> well, I mean, the, the term Afro-American, I say in my book that today it seems innocuous, as, as, as you mentioned, but that doesn't change the fact that that, that term and, and whatever term uh, African Americans use to identify themselves as a group, it's always contested. I mean, they, these, these terms are always contested. In the 1960s was a moment of tremendous con contestation around this. Um, in the standard usage in the press and the media was, was Negro with a capital N. And, you know, I can remember watch and, and you know someone like James Brown was very important in in, in sort of changing uh, African Americans' minds about other terms like Negro and colored and, and really getting them to affirm uh, the, the term black uh, as their identity. And you know I remember James Brown on some talk show and some guy, you know, some white liberal guest is saying, oh the Negro this, the Negro that, and he's like, no, the word is black. And you know uh, I, I can remember that moment very, very distinctly. Um, but Afro-American, as Malcolm and his followers used it, was meant to, I think, to, to lay claim to American citizenship and full African-American participation in the political and economic life of the country, but to maintain this sense of African, of what I'm calling today African-American, and African cultural heritage, that there was this assumption, uh, not only for black people, uh, but for um, people who were from immigrant groups. Uh, you, you could sort of, you could call them white ethnics today, I suppose, but there's this assumption that you leave behind the ways of your um, ancestral homeland, and to become American, become, you know, is you need to just sort of wipe the slate clean. And um, this was an assumption that was really, really imposed upon African Americans. You know, James Baldwin, in the fire next time, writes to his 15-year-old nephew that, um, A, don't believe the racist lies that society is, is telling about you, and, and don't use that as the basis for your identity, and B, uh, never accept the lie that you have to make yourself acceptable um, to white people so that you can integrate into uh, American society. And of course, within that is the assumption that African Americans have to somehow sacrifice what, what they bring to the table in terms of their cultural and historical experience and their, um, their knowledge of what it has meant uh, over time to be black in America. We were just supposed to forget all that. And you know, Baldwin was contesting that, and you know, Baldwin's politics were not identical to Malcolm X's, but I think that's something that they would have, they would have agreed upon. But um, Afro-American was a way to make that political statement, that we are claiming full American citizenship while we are um, hanging on to our, our roots. And not just our African roots, not some invented notion of Africa, but you know, um, a, a solidarity with African peoples in the present, rather than you know, uh, simply um, an identification with ancient African civilizations and, and, and that sort of thing. Oh yes, yes, we have a, a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, another anniversary this year is the 60th anniversary of the Bandung Conference. And of course, Richard Wright was there and wrote his book, The Color Curtain. I just wondered if you could say something about Afro-Asian solidarity, knowing that people like Du Bois were very much engaged in traveling to China. Is that part of your global uh, view? Um, just if that's something you can yeah. say something Yeah, I mean, about. That, it's, it, it's great that you mentioned that this is the 50th anniversary in 2015 of the Bandung Conference of non aligned Nations uh, that took place in Indonesia in 1955. And this got a lot of um, excited press coverage in the African American press. And Richard Wright covered the Bandung Conference. And, and I think, you know, the Bandung Conference and the whole Afro Asian solidarity is certainly a part of the story, part of a, a sort of a global account of the civil rights movement. Insofar as the United Nations 
as you know, uh, emerging African and Asian nations uh, are, are become members of the UN, you had the Afro-Asian bloc voicing criticisms of U.S. Uh, of, of federal uh, collusion with Jim Crow. For example, in 1964, um, when the U.S. decided that there would not be a federal prosecution of uh, the, the killers of the civil rights demonstrators in the Mississippi Freedom Summer, members of the Afro-Asian bloc you know, uh, read their protests into the record. And so, you know, you did have a voice of criticism of, of, of the United States. But there's, there's also the, um, the historic connection between African-American civil rights activists and um, Indian nationalists and um, Gandhian uh, nonviolence as well. So, so there's, there's definitely another story to be, be told about um, Ben Young and uh, what the, the non-aligned movement represented uh, in, in the context of the civil rights. So I'm, I'm glad you reminded me of that anniversary as, as well.